Go ahead and be seated. Thank you, praise team, as always, for getting our hearts ready for what God has for us today in His Word. And, and I will tell you, one of my favorite things, I think I've probably shared with you, with this with you before, one of my favorite things about continuing to read God's Word is that you end up seeing things and experiencing things that maybe, maybe you haven't before. You see it from a little bit different perspective, a little bit more in depth. I had always thought that probably the quintessential chapter in all of Scripture having to deal with faith is Hebrews chapter 11. After making our way through uh, Romans chapter 4, I have now changed that opinion. Uh, this has been an extraordinary, extraordinary chapter talking about something that, as we've talked about before, is very, very difficult to define, and that is faith. It's, it's, it's hard even to come up with a definition, as I have said before, of the word faith without using some version of the word faith, like believe or trust. Even the Bible gives a very enigmatic, as we talked about this several weeks ago, a very enigmatic definition of faith as being the substance of things hoped for and the certainty of things not seen, which is not as clear-cut a definition as sometimes we would want from that. But as we wrap up here, I think what Paul is doing here is showing us another aspect of faith that I had not really thought about. Because remember what the scripture says, the just, the righteous believers will live by faith. How can we live by something that we're not even 100% sure how to define? As we've made our way through this amazing chapter, we have seen that Paul has described Faith is a gift. We've talked about it being a miracle. We've talked about how it is a practical tool. It is the practical tool in which we live the lives that God has called us to, to lead. How can we do the things He wants us to do? If we didn't have faith that He'd given us the ability and the power through His Holy Spirit to do so. But one of the things that I've noticed, especially as we're wrapping up here, um, is that Paul also seems to be saying here that faith is a reminder. It is a daily reminder. We get access to that miracle that we talked about several weeks ago. And faith is a miracle. None of us should believe any of this. But that is not how we are born. We are not be born with the propensity to believe that God even exists. So how in the world do I believe everything that's in that book if I had not been given the gift of faith to believe it in the first place? I wasn't even looking for it, much less believing it. And when we understand that that is a gift that he gives to all of his children, he doesn't pick certain people out and give them faith and not give other people faith. When you come to faith in him, when you are saved, redeemed, born again, that gift of faith has been given to you to believe something that, to be honest with you, should seem unbelievable to us. One of the key elements of salvation is that God literally comes and makes his home in our body through his spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit is what Paul wrote. In 1 Corinthians, he actually lives in us. How in the, and I believe that with every fiber in my being, I believe that. How do I believe that? It doesn't make any sense for me to believe that other than he had given me this extraordinary gift and given you this extraordinary gift. But one of the things as he's wrapping up here, he seems to kind of be doing a little bit of an overview of some of the things he's talked about before. But one of the things he seems to be doing is making sure that we understand that faith is a reminder of all the things that God has promised us. Every day he gives us the ability to believe that. But here we see something really specific. He is letting us know that faith is a reminder ultimately of the gospel. We're going to look at these ten verses here. And each verse has an element of the gospel in it. Every single one of them has an aspect of the gospel. It's one of the most complete explanations of the elements of the gospel with the background of this chapter being faith that faith reminds us of these things every day. We should think about our salvation every day. We should think about God's glory and His hope and His grace and His love and His mercy every day. The only way that happens is through faith. There's no reason for us to remember this. There's no reason as busy as our lives are. Faith is a gift that helps us remember whose we are and who He is. And He reminds us of that every single day. Now I'm going to tell you something that's probably going to scare you, but don't let it. There are ten things He wants us to remember here. And I know, you're scared. You're thinking ten things. We better pack a lunch because we're going to be here for a while. That's not true. 
This is an overview of what Paul is saying here, and that's the way we're going to treat it. We're going to look at these ten elements of salvation that are included in these ten verses, one in each verse. We're not going to drill down very deep on it because that's not the intention of these last few verses here. The intention is to give us an overview and a remembrance of the gospel. What does Paul want us to remember about the gospel, and what does the gift of faith, how does the gift of faith give us the ability to believe that? That's what we're going to look at. So we're going to be wrapping up our fourth chapter in Romans. We're going to be beginning uh, in Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, and I will read until the end of the chapter in verse 25. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in Him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Lord, I thank You that You have allowed us the opportunity. Lord, You've given us the... I don't have the natural desire to read Your Word. I certainly don't have the natural ability to understand Your Word. I want to read Your Word because You have given me that ability. I understand your word because you have given me your spirit. All of this, Lord, is about you. Every aspect of our faith, Lord, as we try to continue to understand this incredible, miraculous gift of faith that you have given to your children, may we exercise it in a way that brings honor and glory to you, and may it bring to our memory every single day of our lives the glorious message of your gospel. And may you be lifted up and glorified, for it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So let's get into this as we've got quite a few of these to cover. How is faith or what does faith remind us of as, as it pertains to all aspects of the gospel? No better way to start out than this one. As we see in verse 16, faith reminds us of God's grace. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. He is making it crystal clear from the very beginning. You see this in Paul's letters over and over and over again. You see it in everybody else's letters over and over and over again. Our salvation is dependent on his grace and his grace alone. I did not go looking for it. I did not want it. I didn't want to have anything to do with, with it in any way, shape, or form. If I had a million lifetimes, I still wouldn't be looking for it in my natural state. The only way that I am saved is because of His grace. And the single greatest act of grace in the history of the universe that God, is that God would save somebody. Anybody. It is the single most important aspect of salvation is the grace that He bestows upon us. What we see in Romans 9, 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion, so that it depends not on human will or work, exertion, but on God who has mercy. It is all his. That is a reminder that faith gives us every day that if we are in the state of salvation, it, to be in a weird kind of way, it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with Him. It is a complete act of God's saving grace. Number two, faith reminds us that He gives life to the dead. 
This is extremely important for us to understand. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of, of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Did you notice what he did not say there? He did not say who made sick people well, even though he does that. Makes bad people good. We're talking about salvation here. Now, he does that stuff for us in our physical lives, but we're not talking about our physical everyday life here. We're talking about salvation. These are reminders of salvation. And when we come to faith in Christ, when God saves us, he is literally giving life to the dead. We are not sick in our sins. We are dead in our sins. Literally dead. He gives us life. That's what salvation is, is the bestowing of life to a dead being. Jesus did not die to make bad people good. I know we think that a lot. We think of Jesus and our relationship with him, our Christianity, our salvation, as it's going to make me a better person. Well, you know, hopefully it will. I mean, that's the expectation. But that's not why he did it. That's a benefit from that happening, but that's not why he did it. He did not make me a better person. He made me a new person. He raised me from literal death. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. Wrote Ephesians, which is what Ephesians 2, 1 specifically said, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. This is not a figure of speech. It's not an analogy. It is the truth. Salvation is God giving life to the dead. I was dead when he found me. If you're a believer, you were dead. And you know, what's, you know why that's so hard for us to understand? Because we do a lot of things for dead people, don't we? We go to work. We have families. We, we're here. We, we, we do all of these things so we don't think of ourselves as dead. But if we don't think of ourselves as, with, as dead, then what God seems to be is a behavior modifier. He's just going to make you nicer, make you better, make you a better husband, make you a better wife, make you a better mother, father, whatever, employee, whatever, sibling, child. Does all that stuff happen? Yes, ideally that's what's supposed to happen. But that's not why he saved me. He saved me because I was dead and couldn't save myself. He literally gave me life. So faith reminds us that he gives life to the dead. Faith also reminds us of his hope. And I put the emphasis on his. Verse 18, in hope he believed against hope. I love that phrase. In hope he believed, he's just talking about Abraham here, but of course he's talking about us. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Abraham, and therefore us, we hope against hope. What does that phrase mean? it means that we have not even the capability of hope apart from him. There was no, Abraham was a pagan. He was an old man. His wife was barren. There was no reason for him to have any hope in any way, shape, or form. You know, one of the things that I've noticed, one of the more prevalent philosophies that has unfortunately engulfed our nation you see it in movies, you see it in TV shows, you see it in books, you see it when people talk, is this idea of nihilism. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that philosophical concept of nihilism, but in a nutshell, nihilism means there is no hope. There's no hope in life, there's no hope in, in anything. And I emphasized earlier that we're talking about God's hope, not our hope. That's a word that's translated into English that we sort of, it, it doesn't carry the same weight. Our word hope is not the same word that's in Scripture. Our word hope is really a synonym for wish, isn't it? If I say I hope something's going to happen, I'm not sure it's going to happen, right? I'm really saying I wish that would happen, but there's no guarantee that that's going to be the case. So we have to understand what God means by hope, not what we mean by hope, and that hope is supernatural. It's not a natural thing. The hope that we talk about, like, I hope my team wins. I hope I get that raise. I hope I can get this. I hope we go there. I hope this person gets better. That is not what he's talking about here. In Proverbs 23, 18, God says, Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. This is a hope that's not our hope. It is a certainty. In fact, the word in the original language is defined as, 
uh, and the anticipation of a thing with the certainty of getting it. So when I say that I cling on to the hope of heaven, I'm not saying I hope I get to heaven. Not in our vernacular, in our understanding of that. This is a supernatural gift that faith reminds us of every single day, that our hope is a certainty in Him. We have no natural desire to do that. We have no natural ability to do that. And that only comes because of the incredible, miraculous gift of faith that we can hang on and cling to that hope. Number four, faith reminds us of His sovereignty. And every single believer out there will tell you without batting an eyelash that they believe in the sovereignty of God until we don't. Until something happens that we're not all that crazy about. Until we're in a situation, whether we've put ourselves there or not, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. When we look at it and say, it can't be this way, I don't understand what God is doing. And I'll give you a personal example of that when we wrap up here in just a little bit. God is completely, 100% sovereign. What is He sovereign over? Everything. Everything. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Did you notice what that sentence did not say? It does not say all things are going to feel good, sound good. Our experience may be that it's not all that good. But God is sovereign. I love this verse here because of what He's saying here about Abraham and about His sovereignty. In verse 19, He, meaning Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, which kind of sounds like an insult here from Paul. He's being a little insensitive. Ah, he was as good as dead. Why? Because he was 100 years old. But I know what he means by that. When he considered his body, which is good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, God chose, we talked about this several weeks ago, when God chose Abraham, he literally chose one of the most, if not the most, unlikely person on the planet to choose to do what he had to do. Abraham's kicking back, getting ready for retirement, moved back close to his family, ready to enjoy his golden years. And God not only calls him and says, I want you to go, he didn't even tell him where he was going. Go to a place I will show you. As I have said so many times before, as I have been married to my Beautiful bride for 35 years. We've been together a lot longer than that. I've known, we've known each other since we were six years old. Many of you know that story. That would be a hard sell for me to go to tell her at this point in our lives, hey, we need to go somewhere. Why? Because God said, okay, cool, I can see that. Where are we going? I don't have any idea. How long is it going to take to get there? Pfft, your guess is as good as mine. He was the least likely person. Sarah was the least likely person to have a child. In her most fruitful years, she couldn't have a child. But why did all of that end up happening? Because God is sovereign. Do you know why I believe what I believe? Because of His sovereignty. Not because I figured it out. Not because I weighed the options. Not because I came to some sort of internal enlightenment on my own. I am saved because of His sovereign grace. You are saved because of His sovereign grace. God is sovereign. And faith reminds us of that when it is so difficult for us at times to believe it. Number five, faith reminds us of His glory. No unbelief made Him waver concerning the promise of God but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. When I was saved, when I was 20 years old, the benefits that I got from being saved are eternal. They're undeserved. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It's the greatest thing that will ever happen or could possibly ever happen to me. I get all the benefits. But that's not why he saved me. 
He saved me to reveal His glory. We get the benefits. He gets the glory. It's extraordinary. We have a tendency to think of salvation as being, you know, something for us. And it is. Don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Obviously it is. And obviously we get all the benefits. But He didn't save us just to give us the benefits. He saved it to glorify Himself. Because I was completely unworthy of being saved. As were you. As is every single human being on this planet. And the fact that He would give salvation to anyone is absolutely a testament to His glory. It glorifies Him. Faith reminds us of that. Even though we benefit from it, He's the one that gets, for lack of a better word, the credit. He's the one that gets the glory, which is the way, obviously, it is supposed to. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God said, Let the light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In fact, you heard me mention before, you, you, I mentioned it this morning, you heard me mention it just about every Sunday, the Westminster Catechism. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Westminster Catechism, but a lot of people are familiar with the very first one. They're all numbered in order. The very first one, what is the chief end of all believers? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That is the chief end of us all. So faith reminds us of His glory. Number six, it also reminds us of His promises. Verse 21. Fully convinced that God was able to do what He had promised. God is the only being in the universe who has the desire and the ability to keep His promises. He is the only one. Let me ask you something without you raising your hand. Because everybody in here would raise their hand. Have you ever broken a promise? God cannot break a promise. I'm not saying we don't have the best of intentions. We can make a promise and then what, what do we say a lot of times? Something came up. With God, nothing ever comes up. Do you know how many promises there are in Scripture? I don't think anybody really knows. Because if you Google it, I've seen a low of 3,000 and a high of 30,000. That's a pretty wide, uh, wide, wide range there. The number you see more than any other is around 8,000. But let's go. <laughs> let's go with the lowest number, 3,000. Is it even remotely possible for you to keep 3,000 promises if you made them? I'd be lucky to get through three. He has the ability and the desire to keep His promises. Whatever He promises me, He will keep. That is the essence of how do I know? How You ask me, how, you ask me if, hey, Danny, you're going to go to heaven? Absolutely. No doubt in my mind. How do you know that? Because He promised me. He promised me. And He cannot, not will not, he cannot break his promises. This is extraordinary what faith does for us to be able to understand that, realize that, and believe that. Not only does faith remind us of his promises, it reminds us of his righteousness. We see here in verse 22, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. He's again quoting the verse that he used back in uh, uh, verse 3 of this chapter, Abraham believed, which was quoting, of course, Genesis 15. And Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. i got to tell you, I think this is the most miraculous part of the gospel. The single most miraculous part of the gospel is that when I came to faith in him, somebody he owed nothing to, nothing, who deserved every single bit of eternal punishment because I was born into sin. And as I've said to you so many times before, I wasn't a bad guy. If you had known me then, you probably would have liked me. I didn't go out and, you know, do, I mean, I, mean, I did my share of stupid stuff because I was a kid. But I wasn't a, you, nobody would have ever pointed to that guy and say, I was a bad guy there. I was a likable guy. I was a friendly guy. People liked being around me. And I was deserving of eternal separation from him. And when he saved me, he not only saved me, he not only forgave me for my sin, He not only created a new creation, He not only raised me from the dead, gave me life, 
the scripture tells us that the righteousness of God was then placed on me. The righteousness of God. Think about it. Because there's only one righteous being in the universe. And even when I say now that I have righteousness, it's not mine. It's his. The righteousness of God, which he talked about in such eloquence and in such detail. Just one chapter prior to this. In Romans chapter 3, Paul writes, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. He places His righteousness on us. Faith helps us and reminds us of that extraordinary, amazing transaction that takes place. It reminds us of His righteousness. Number eight, it reminds us of His Word. Look at verse 23. But the words it was counted to Him were not written for His sake alone. I love how He throws that in there because if we were reading that and Abraham believed God and it was credited to Him as righteousness and it had nothing to do with us, we would be left with, good for Abraham. But what does that leave me? And He's sitting here right now telling us that that was not written for Abraham alone. It was written and promised to us. How do we know that? How do we know anything about God? How do we know anything about who we are apart from Him and in Him? How do we know any of this stuff? Anybody want to take a wild stab in the dark? It is His Word. That is the only way we can know who He truly is. He gives us the ability to understand it, but we cannot get it any other way than through His Word. How do we know whether there are 3,000 or 30,000 promises? His Word. How do we know that His righteousness is placed on us? His Word. How do we know that He died on a cross? His Word. How do we know how we're supposed to live? His Word. Every single thing always goes back to His Word. And he is reminding of this, of this. How do we understand the gospel? How do we believe the gospel? His word. And faith reminds us of his word. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It always goes back to His Word, and faith reminds us of the trustworthiness of His Word. Number nine, faith reminds us of the resurrection. In fact, these last two get to the crux of the gospel. He mentions the resurrection, and he mentions the cross. Not two separate events, by the way, but two sides of the same coin. Verse 24, but for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in Him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. The resurrection where the totality of salvation, where my sin and your sin, if you are a believer, was paid for, was completed on that third day when they went into the tomb to finish preparing the body and found Him risen. The resurrection, the Father Himself, it says He raised His Son from the dead. This is the crux of the gospel. It's the crucifixion and resurrection. And it had to be that way. If Jesus had not died, there would have been no resurrection. If there had been no resurrection, Jesus just would have been a martyr, like any other long list of martyrs that we had then and still have today. Faith reminds us of that glorious event And what it means to us. John, I love, absolutely love this passage. This conversation he has is one of the most poignant and heart-touching conversations he ever had with another human being. Jesus said to her, your, this is uh, uh, the raising of Lazarus. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That is the quintessential question, is it not? Do you believe in this resurrection? So faith reminds us of his resurrection. And number 10, finally, he reminds us, faith reminds us of the cross. 
who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our just good. That term delivered up means to be delivered up for crucifixion. And one of the things I love about this verse, in one clause of one sentence, he gives the entire reason why Jesus had to die a horrible, brutal death, and it was for our offenses. Why did Jesus have to die so brutally? Because sin is that bad. And he was taking the punishment that I rightly deserved. If you're a believer, you rightly deserved it. He was taking that punishment on himself. It would have not been enough for him to die a more peaceful death, a less violent death. God was pouring out his wrath. You know why? Because God has to pour out his wrath. If he doesn't pour out his wrath on sin, he's a bad judge. And God cannot be a bad judge. His wrath will be poured out onto sin. And if I had a million lifetimes, I'd never be able to thank him enough for having it poured out on his son instead of on me. He wasn't crucified because he was, you know, went through a kangaroo court and a show trial and was lied about and manipulated and they worked the system. <laughs> None of that stuff was true. I mean, it happened. But Jesus addressed that, didn't he, when he was talking to Pilate? Don't you know I have the power to crucify you, Pilate said, or to set you free? And I absolutely love Jesus' response. You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. He's standing in front of the guy who's going to uh, sign his death warrant, putting him through. He, he knows what's coming. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be God if he didn't. And he looks at Pilate and says, you're just a cog in the wheel. You're a cog in the wheel. You're just playing the part that you're supposed to play. And all of this is going to ultimately glorify God. All of these reminders, all of these reminders of the gospel are found in these last ten. Every single element we talk to is an element of the gospel. Faith reminds us of the gospel. And I got to tell you, I don't know about you, but I need that. I desperately, desperately need that in my life. I am sure not unlike you. In the times that I've had in my, there have been times in my life where I've wondered what in the world God is doing. And the more dire the situation, the more significant that response is. And I was in the Navy as a chaplain. Most of you probably know that. When I was in the Navy as a chaplain, I would have people come to see me all the time. The vast majority of things that I did in the Navy were counseling. If I had to put a percentage on the number of, or the, the percentage of the people that came into me for some sort of spiritual help, that wanted to hear the gospel, that wanted help with their faith, that wanted to discover God, I would say it was probably a, a generous estimate would be maybe 10% probably less than that. Everybody else wanted me to get them out of the Navy, get them out of the Marine Corps, get them out of trouble, fix their broken marriages. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't mind talking to them about that stuff. And when they came in to see me, they certainly got the gospel. They certainly got all that stuff. They didn't care about any of that stuff. Do you know how many times in that 20 years I was thinking, God, what are you doing? I'm not making any difference in this at all. A full 90 plus percent of the people are coming to see, they don't care about you. It was really easy to fall into that. And I'll tell you when it got really bad. It would get really bad when I was on deployment for months and months and months away from my family. And I did the same thing every day. And it seemed like I was absolutely stuck in mud. The worst time of that was when I was in Afghanistan. I was assigned to a combat engineer battalion. We did a deployment to a combat deployment to Afghanistan, same stuff, same stuff every day, except this time it was different. I'm a lot further away from my family. I'm surrounded by people who want to shoot me and blow me up. And we sent guys home with fewer limbs than they had when they got there. And we sent guys home in flag draped coffins. And I would be lying to you if I didn't say many times, God, why am I here? Nothing seems to be, for lack of a better word, working. I don't see this. And then God is so gracious, and it's a little bit of a curveball. I'll, I'll, we'll get to that here in just a second. God was so gracious. I remember 
You might be wondering why I would remember preaching an Easter morning service in Afghanistan back in 2012, but I remember it like it was yesterday. We were out at one of our forward operating bases. I don't know if I've told you this story before. Maybe I have. We're at one of our forward operating bases. One of our companies out there was building what we could forward operating bases, FOBs. And, and they were out there building it up. So I was with the boss, and we went out there to pay a visit to it, make sure things were going okay. I only then realized, because you lose all track of days and times and weeks when you're on deployment, especially in the middle of nowhere, like Afghanistan. And then it dawned on me, we were there on a Saturday, and it dawned on me that the next day was Easter. And, and me and the boss were getting ready to, to go back early Sunday morning, but I went to the, uh, I went to the company uh, uh, commanding officer, company CEO, and said, hey, you know, tomorrow's, tomorrow's Easter. We're going to leave early, but if you guys want me to do an Easter service before you go, I'll be glad to do it. And he jumped all over. Yeah. And it was dark when we started. I mean, like dark, dark. And so they had all, because they had all this construction stuff there, they had all this wood, and they were kind of using it like bleachers. We actually had a really big crowd. I was kind of frankly surprised these guys would get up that early for that. So we had a, we had a big, big, pretty big crowd out there, and, and, and everybody was sitting on the bleachers. And first, all I could do was make out shapes because it was dark. But we really was a sunrise service. How many people get to say they preached an Easter sunrise service in the middle of Afghanistan, right? And so I'm, I'm sitting there doing my message, very gospel-heavy message, obviously, because it's Easter Sunday. And the sun starts coming up. And in the middle of the message, I start looking around like I do with you guys. I, you know, try to, try to make some eye contact with you and, 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 uh, and look at your faces while I'm talking. And I, I was looking around, and seated next to the company CEO was his interpreter. Because every company CEO had a, a local, which, by the way, was a very dangerous job for them, to be an interpreter for the American military. He had his interpreter sitting next to him. He couldn't have been more than 19 or 20 years old. And it dawned on me when I saw him sitting there because he, was, he had all the body language of somebody who was hanging on every word. Right? Obviously, he knew English or he wouldn't be a, a, an interpreter. And he's sitting down there and he's listening. And it dawned on me when I was talking that this is probably the first time this kid has ever heard the gospel. He was raised Muslim. Why would he have ever heard the gospel in any way, shape, or form? This is probably the first time he heard anything about Jesus. And I thought to myself as we were making that long drive back to the, the CP, the command post, Lord, if this is the only reason you sent me here, if this is the only reason, you know what? I'm okay with that. Two, almost two years later, back at Camp Lejeune, walking down the P-way, passageway, anyway, the hallway. We call it different things in the military. So walking down the P-way in a building and, and walking down, and this Marine walks past me, and he stops me, and he said, you were in Afghanistan in 2012. <laughs> I was like, this is like two years later. I said, yeah, I was in Afghanistan in 2012. He's, he used to preach at, preach at the chapel there at Camp Leatherneck. I said, yeah, I used to preach there quite often. And he said, I can't tell you what some of your messages meant to me. And then he just moved on. Now, here's the curveball I was talking to you about earlier. Please don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to tell you. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciated those moments where God was showing me that he was at work. But can I give you the other side of that? I shouldn't have needed it. I shouldn't have needed it. How does that make me any different than Thomas? I only believe you're working because I see it. You see what I'm talking about? It was a great blessing. Don't get me wrong. But it doesn't matter whether I saw it or not. God had me there for a reason. Even if I never understand the reason he had me there. He has me in the positions and the situations you're in for a reason. Does he promise you that you're going to see that reason? No, he does not. He promises there is a reason. I wanted my faith to be at a point that I didn't need those two reminders. I was glad to have it. It was a gift from God. I am not belittling that in any way, shape, or form. But it bothered me that I needed it. Because that's what faith is. The certainty of things not seen. It's a glorious gift God has given us. You are going to find yourself, if you're not there now, in situations where you're thinking the same thing I was when I was stuck in Afghanistan for seven months. You're not working. I don't see how any of this is helping. I made a mistake. 
I, whatever the case may be, that's not the way it works. There are no mistakes with God. We are exactly where he wants us to be. The only thing is, do we believe it? Do we trust it? Are we exercising that incredible, miraculous gift? I don't ever want to need reassuring like that again. But here's the one thing I know, is that if I need it, he's going to give it to me. He's going to give it to me. And while it did make me feel good, it also showed me a shortcoming in my life. I want to trust him no matter what. No matter what the circumstances are, whether I see it or not. That, to be honest with you, is what faith is all about. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here this morning, Lord, to wrap up this incredible chapter on this most glorious gift that you have given us. This gift of faith, Lord, it is a gift. It's not only a gift, it's a miracle that we have any of this in our lives, Lord. May we exercise it in faith. That we use our faith to exercise our faith. That we tap into that reservoir of faith that you have given each and every one of your children. That no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how out of whack they are from what we would want them to be or think they should be, Lord, that we would simply trust you and that we would indeed have the certainty of things not seen because that is the essence of faith, Lord, is being certain of your promises, of your love, of your grace, of your mercy, of your gospel. Lord, if, if I believe in a heaven that I have not seen, then I can believe you're working in my life when I can't see that. And that all things would work together for good, as your word says. And bless us as we get ready to leave this place, Lord. May we exercise our faith. May we do what your word says and, and, and exercise the idea that the just live by faith. The faith that you have given us, the faith that you're the author of, the faith that you dispense and the faith that you activate in our lives. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen.